In the last video, we talked about the what behind untethering and some of the why behind it. And also we talked about the common misconception people have about untethering. And really we said uh, how untethering is really the most crucial internal shift you need to learn if you want to reconcile, if you want to allow your partner to fall back into that relationship. And really, if you want to get yourself success in more falling outcomes, which is the outcomes that really uh, count for the most success in life as well. So if you want success in life, you need to learn how to untether. So if you haven't watched part one yet, I would suggest you stop this video and go to part one because part two will not make sense without part one. But in this part, we'll talk about the how to untether. And after observing 5,000 plus clients go through my process of untethering, I've noticed that there are six common pitfalls that people fall into. So we're going to talk about the six common pitfalls to make sure you don't fall for it as well. Now, before we start this video, I want to give you the same word of caution I give to all these uh, longer form how-to videos. And I want to start again with my biggest fears is people twisting and bending my videos to be used for bad instead of good and people underestimating the power or the standard in which people should be implementing and using these processes and these skills that I teach you. So at this point, you guys know about the black eye story that I have. And it's this guy who chooses to not enroll in the program and kept telling me that he understands what untethering is. He understands what being bulletproof is and he's doing really well in his relationship. But then I get a FaceTime from his wife at one point with, and she came to the call with a black eye. And she said basically, hey, my husband has been watching your videos. He's worse than ever. And we actually had another story uh, where this guy, this new client came in and he's been watching my videos for a long time. And his wife called me and she basically said, oh my God, my husband's worse than ever. So we talked to his wife. We talked to him as well. And this is the follow-up text that we got afterwards. Whatever conversation you had with the client after we spoke last Wednesday, seems something seems to be working. He's talking, engaging, not frantic. He's, he's made no pledges. I haven't seen it before. It's a little rough. Feels refreshingly authentic and sustainable. Thank you for taking the time, et cetera. It's going well with the kids too. So again, remember guys, there is a vast distance between conceptual and experiential mastery. And this is not like learning hard skills. So not only is there, again, a vast distance between conceptual and experiential, being able to understand it logically and being able to do it. And like hard skills, for example, I can point to you with the problems on a board and we can both agree and see the problems. But here, when we talk about soft skills, we're talking about fighting through a lot of denial, a lot of uh, blind spots, et cetera. So you don't want to be what we call wrongfully certain. And all these people that I showed you earlier, those are wrongfully certain people. They're wrong, but they're so certain in their wrongfulness. And this is actually what we call the hemorrhage. So please do not fall for this. Do not gamble with your time. You only have one life, guys. You only have one life to create the best legacy you can, to create the best life, the most fulfilling life you can. You do not have time and the luxury to be wrongfully certain for so long. So you want to make sure you learn the right skills as early as possible and make sure you spend minimal time falling for that wrongfully certain trap. Again, you have one life. Please don't waste it. Now, please don't make me regret creating these longer form videos because there's a reason why I haven't created too much long form videos and uh, videos that go deep into the how because they get misunderstood a lot. It's really like giving people a very sharp knife without teaching people how to use that sharp knife. And you could use it for really evil things if you're not careful. So again, if you can join the program, please do. Please consider it because the program has a community in there, has a bunch of coaches in there, including myself which we will not allow this wrongfully certain trap to happen too long. And if you want quick results like this, where you you're stop creating so much hemorrhages right in the beginning, and you want to actually see progress and not let your blind spot mistakes destroy, continue destroying your relationship, then the program is there for a reason. But I understand also that a lot of you guys cannot join the program for whatever reason, whether it's financial, whether you didn't meet the quota, or you didn't make the cut um, to be part of the quota that we have every month. So if you cannot join for any reason, guys, 
please comment and engage. I don't want you to spend too long in the wrongfully certain trap. Whatever questions you have, give it to me. And so guys, if you want to apply for the program, we have a masterclass that you need to join first. I'll leave the comment down below for the, to the masterclass, but at the end of the masterclass, we'll show you how to apply. But during the masterclass, we'll show you what the program is about, what you will get. And at the end, we'll show you how to apply as well if you're interested in applying. So with that said, guys, let's go into the big picture of how to untether. So again, just to go back to the first part, we said that untethering is simply about shifting your dopamine systems, your mental focus, your addiction away from looking at outcomes as outcomes, circumstances, and other people as a source of motivation, as a guidance for what you do, and redirecting it into the intrinsic love of the process as your main source of motivation, energy, inspiration, etc. So if you look at the general process to untethering, it really has two parts. You can think of it like clothes. So first, if you want to uh, take off your, if you want to change your clothes, you got to take off the old one, right? So here we're trying to identify disguise mind viruses. And if these terms don't make sense to you, then I would encourage you to watch an earlier video where we talk about the general uh, process for creating auto suggestions, creating internal shifts. But we want to identify the mind viruses that is keeping us tethered. And we want to force our mind to see the absurdity of the disguise. So usually once people see the mind virus that is at play and they see the absurdity, it's impossible for your mind to keep falling for that uh, disguise of desire to keep yourself tethered. When you do this, you are actually creating a big cognitive dissonance because once you know you shouldn't do something, it's really hard actually for you to keep doing that thing. And so this part right here, the main goal is to shift you away from the old addiction, from the old focus, from the old programming. Now, once we take off the old, we need to replace that void that is created by taking off the old with a new and healthier process. So this is when we're going to train our mind to become more of a farmer. And this part is putting on the new part really shifts you into the new addiction, into the process. So again, take off the old. Now that we take off the old, we're naked. We need to put on the new with something better. Okay. It's that simple guys. And I don't want you to overcomplicate the process. It's actually that simple. So the point, remember, is to get into the middle, to effort and surrender. We don't want to be tethered, so we need to take off the old. But when we just take off the old and we're just naked, we risk falling into hopeless indifference. So a lot of people, again, make the mistake of uh, misconstruing untethering as, I don't care about my relationship. I don't care about the outcome. No. If you just take off the old and you say to yourself, I don't care about the outcome, that is indifference. That is actually, as we said in the first part, a form of tetheredness. What we want is we want to replace the old with the new, and we want to still be in a position where we want the outcome, but we no longer need it. But our, if we want the outcome, we also understand that to get the outcome, we need to be having 100% effort and surrender to that process. Again, I'm not going to talk about the why untethering is so key, but look at some of my clients' uh, testimonials here. Untethering is a must. Basically, every single client stories you hear of why their changes became genuine, why their partner was able to fall into their changes and trust their changes for the long haul and why their actions, their changes are believable is simply because they learn to untether. That is the root internal shift that creates everything happening, that allows everything to happen. Untethering is like the soil. Without the soil, the plant cannot grow. The plant of relationships cannot grow. So I'm not going to go to the why again. If you want to understand the why, again, we had discussed it in part one. So go to part one if you have not seen that yet. So let's dive deeper now into what it means to take off the old processes. So when it comes to taking off the old, we're really talking about all the suggestions. So if you remember from the previous video uh, that we discussed around auto suggestions, the goal is to find the mind virus, the mind virus that is tricking you and disguising itself as a good thing and tricking you into believing the mind virus 
victim mindsets, disguised as desire, for example. So the idea behind auto suggestions is that we want to shift away and into. So the shifting away is basically taking off the old. So remember again that a good auto suggestion has five parts. It has what are the voices of the victim mindset of the disguises. And I want you to consciously tell yourself how they have fucked you in the past and how are they fucking me now? If you are able to answer these questions properly, viscerally, so it's polarized and it's very visceral, they will effectively, very effectively shift you away. So to give you an example of this, let's talk about one of these illusions, let's say urgency illusion. So we need to understand that, you know, the urgency illusion works by telling you that your situation is dire. And because of that, a lot of people fall into what we call the illusion of action, which is when people are finding themselves in this very dire situation and they want to find a lot of tactics, a lot of short-term things, a lot of like, what can I do now? What can I say now to change my mind, to change my partner's mind right now? So we need to understand that the urgency illusion, while it might sound good, is disguising itself as a good thing. The urgency illusion will really force you to look for a lot of shortcuts, will force you to look for a lot of uh, quick fixes, a lot of ingenuine quick, quick fixes. And if you look at your life, Whenever you fall for the urgency illusion, you don't actually work on the real things and you actually do things that actually take you further away from the outcome. So anytime you do any needy things in your relationship, for example, um, just like what this client did up above. So we said basically, oh, he's talking and engaging. It's not frantic, desperate or over positive. He has made no pledges. I haven't seen it before. It's a little rough and it feels refreshingly authentic and sustainable. This is the person who has been falling for the urgency illusion for a long time. He feels like he needs to do something now, 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 right? But once we talk to this client and once this client understands the absurdity of falling for the urgency illusion, how the urgency illusion has done nothing to his life, but actually wreak more havoc and take him further away from the outcome that he wants and push people further away. That is when he basically takes off the old. He basically realizes, ooh, I see now the absurdity of urgency illusion. And same thing for something like importance illusion, for example. Remember when I was playing golf, trying to be an athlete, I used to place so much importance on every tournament, on every shot, on every round. And I felt like I had to treat every shot, every tournament as important because if I don't, it feels wrong somehow. It feels like I'm not taking it seriously maybe. But once I see that holding a tournament to a pedestal like that is actually getting me to choke up even more, once I see that disguise and the absurdity, it helps me to take off the old. And the same thing for relationships. Uh, we, we always say relationships are a big one big performance. And so if you hold too much importance to a certain conversation, to a certain moment, to a certain partner, if you hold someone to a pedestal, Yes, it feels like you're taking responsibility and it feels wrong to not care because at the same time, it feels like you don't care. But think about it. Falling for the important solution makes you choke up in your life too. And think about how many times you've choked up in your relationship, in your life, because this important conversation, for example, that you have wasn't going the way you want right away. And you panic. And because you panic, you choke and you make things worse, etc. So the goal again with this first part, right, guys, is to allow you to see what are the voices. So what are the, the, the disguise of desire that you're falling for? And once you find this, see the paradoxical ways they have fucked you in the past. You have to allow yourself to see the absurdity of it and see how they're about to fuck you right now. So with this client, for example, if you go back all the way up here, this client, the reason why he was doing the things that was driving his wife crazy in the first place was because we were telling him, hey, don't do what you're used to do. Try this instead. Try this method that doesn't allow you to fall into urgency illusion. But the illusion in his mind is so strong that he feels the need. He can't help but feel the need to do something now. Like He, can't, he couldn't help it. So because he doesn't see that right now, the temptation that he's feeling of wanting to fall once again to the urgent illusion is them 
basically allowing the illusion to fuck him again right now. So the illusion has fucked him so many times in the past, but you have to see how it's fucking you right now. And once you make these three very visceral and polarized, you snap out of it, right? You really snap out of it. And think of moments when you snapped out of things in your life, when you see the big picture, when you're in an angry state and suddenly you snap out of it. This will allow you to snap out of it, okay? You want this to be very strong. And that's uh, what taking off the old really means. And we want to make sure it's thriving, not surviving. So you cannot just tell yourself uh, to get out of these voices by telling yourself to get out of these voices. These two actually need to have some very salient, very important, very convincing points behind them. So think about in the previous video, we talked about the ammo. It needs to have the right ammo. So you can't just tell yourself, stop falling for those voices. Stop falling for those voices. You actually have to give the voices and yourself some compelling reasons why and how they fucked you in the past. Okay, so you need, it needs to be thriving. It needs to be very much thriving, not surviving. Surviving is when you just tell yourself, stop it, stop it, stop it. This is when you're actually uh, giving yourself some compelling reasons why you should get out of it. So taking out the old is quite simple. And the more you consciously try to take off the old, and the more you basically remind yourself, oh, this is how I fall for a disguise. And this is uh, how this disguise has, has, has really fucked up my life in the past the more awareness you build for it and the quicker you get in, a, in being able to spot when you fall for disguise and pick and pulling yourself out of the disguise. But once you pull yourself out of disguise again, remember, we need to put on a new process. We need to put on some new clothes. And for this, I'm gonna show you five things I teach my clients that I do myself to this day, even nine years later, I still do this five, all five things every single day that really gets me to untether and put and, and, and shift my attention to the new. So the first thing is really, this is where parts four and five of the R suggestion process comes in. So when you look at it, what do I need to shift to? And mythologizing the shift, those are the two parts that will get me to shift, not only shift away, the first three parts, but then shift into. Again, this needs to be polarized, visceral, and it also needs to be thriving. So again, the whole point behind this is that I need to find the right process to shift towards. So instead of falling for the urgency illusion, for example, and trying to find some tactics and short-term things to say, if you were a client of the program, you would shift your attention to, okay, let's focus on what I need to do now. I need to focus on the auto-suggestion process. I need to focus on learning my TTH and learning my frameworks, right? Once I do that, then I need to focus on executing my TTH, executing my frameworks, and also executing the internal shifts. That's what you need to focus on. That's it is very similar to an athlete. If you want to win this tournament, so if you are, let's say on the 16th hole of golf, and you have three more holes, and all you need to do is get pars for the three more holes to win the tournament, shift your attention away from thinking about how important the outcome is and into, ha, huh, here's my pre-shot routine. Here's the process I need to focus on. If I just do this, I will hit good shots. If I take it one shot at a time, I will hit good shots and I will eventually win. I don't need to think about the win, but I just need to focus on the process, double down on the process. So you need to identify what is the process you need to shift to. And you need to then mythologize that shift. So you need to tell yourself some very compelling stories of why focusing on the process and focusing on these process will get me the outcome that I want. And the reason behind this part is that this part really allows you to learn to love the processes intrinsically. So if you look at any athlete, for example, they learn to love the process of improving, the process of practicing, because they have done a lot to mythologize that shift. So a lot of you are wondering basically, hey, Jeff, I thought you told me to not focus on the outcome. So again, remember, untethering is this fine balance. It's us getting out from need into want, not hopeless indifference. So it's okay to want an outcome, but it's not okay to want to need an outcome and not focus on the process. It's not also not okay to just pretend that you don't want a certain outcome. It's okay to want an outcome, but you need to understand that to get the outcome, if you want the outcome, you need to love this process intrinsically. 
And so this mythologizing is one process that allows you to learn to love the process of growing, of improvement, of the process itself intrinsically. And again, we need to make sure this is thriving. So you cannot just tell yourself, for example, hey, focus on this process and willpower yourself, bro your way into loving the process. Love it, love it, love it. You actually, again, have to give yourself some very compelling reasons of why the process needs to be loved intrinsically, why you can love the process intrinsically. If I am trying to mythologize the process of, let's say, TTH or frameworks or auto suggestions, I will say it like this. Hey, Jeff, imagine a life where you can show your kids, you can show your wife, and you can show your employees, you can show everyone around you that nothing can break you. Imagine going through really difficult moments, and instead of those moments breaking you down, you actually learn, you actually grow, you actually show people that you get better with more pressure. Think about how much safety that creates. Think about how much trust that creates. Think about how much respect that creates. Think about how amazingly your wife can look at you when you can do that. Think about how ir irreplaceable you can become when you do that. When I mythologize it like that, right, and I make it legendary like that, when I look at the daily things that I have to do, like auto suggestions, like learning the frameworks, it helps me love doing those things because I know it's going to make me a fucking legend. Again, this is when you need to have the right process, but also the right ammo to properly mythologize the shift. And I've been working on this for nine years, and I'm always improving the way, the types of processes I, I point to, but also the way I mythologize the shift. I am learning to love the process intrinsically more and more and more every single day. And this is what you need to do too. So that's one thing you can do to learn to shift into is that you need to identify what to shift into and you need to mythologize that shift so that you can love it intrinsically. The second thing that I do is I simply cultivate what I call a farmer's mind. So remember again that we have evolved for millions of years to be very tethered because we were hunting and gathering for millions of years. Only post agriculture and industrial revolution do we actually now get rewarded more for farming. So again, think about any success you have in life. Any success now requires a farming mindset, losing weight, getting fit, building a business, relationships. What you do today, you're not going to see the results of it till much later. So if you're still a hunter, you will, you'll, it'll be very difficult for you to get success in today's day and age. So the reason why we want to cultivate a farmer's mindset is that we want to reprogram our brain away from being so tethered, a hunter, into our farmer. And this right here is an example of what a hunter's life looks like. So if this green line right here represents the intrinsic value of something. This red line is the extrinsic value of something. So anything in life, guys, there's intrinsic value and extrinsic value. If you look at stocks, for example, let's say a company is worth $100 per share right now right? Based on their cash flow, based on their actual earnings, they're worth $100 per share. You'll notice that the, the, the price will always fluctuate around $100. So the extrinsic value always fluctuates around the intrinsic value, but they'll always mean revert to an intrinsic value. So sometimes the price may be 110, it might dip down to 90, sometimes 120, then 80, right? But they're always going to average out to that intrinsic value. And if you think about it, anything in life has intrinsic value and extrinsic value. My business, EV and IB, for example, given the way we do sales right now, given the value of the program, given the way we market, given our people, everything that we have gives our, pro, our business a specific intrinsic value. Let's say the intrinsic value right now for us is $300,000 per month of revenues. Sometimes though, some months we're going to be at 350. Some months we're going to be at 220 and 380, then sometimes maybe even 200 on a dot. Some months is lower, but again, it fluctuates around the IV. The EV always fluctuates around the IV. In relationships, same thing. The, my ability to lead conversations makes up part of my intrinsic value. My ability to control myself, to create safety, to create admiration, to create alignment represents my intrinsic value. Now, 
some days are better, some days are worse, some days are better, some days are worse, some days are better, but overall they mean revert to this intrinsic value. Same thing for weather, right? Thinking about this as climate and this is weather. So if you live in a certain climate that has an average temperature of 30 degrees, for example, or, or 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 60 degrees Fahrenheit, or maybe 20 degrees Celsius if you are in not in America, you use Celsius. So if the average temperature is 40 degrees, for example, some is going to be 45, 35, maybe 48, 32. But on average, it would mean revert to the intrinsic value. So for a hunter, the intrinsic value stays pretty flat because again, they're not building their farm. Whatever they do just feeds them for that day. That's it. So if they're hungry, they hunt and they get food. Once they get food, they get complacent and they can complacent until they get hungry again, then they hunt, but they're not building a farm. They're not building a repository of things. They're not building anything. They're just feeding themselves for, for a day, hungry, day, hungry, day, hungry. So if you were a hunter, like my client was at the beginning, and you're trying to seek shortcuts, tactics, et cetera, you're basically having this pattern. So you're going to feel like up and down, up and down, up and down, but you're never going to get anywhere. This could, line could last 50 years, 60 years. You're never going to get anywhere. This is a hunter's pattern. But a farmer is not really affected by the short term up and down. A farmer has learned to love the process of growing their intrinsic value intrinsically. So any of the process that we teach in the program is for you to shift your attention away from the weather and into the process that grows this. And what we say basically is that when you just grow this, you will eventually see this growing as well. Sure, it's going to have ups and downs. To be honest, the ups and downs are more variant than this. But some days going to be good, bad, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. But overall, you're having higher lows and higher highs. And if you just work on your intrinsic value, you will eventually get higher. The only way you can get out of this pattern is if you work on this intrinsic value. And this is uh, applicable to anything in life, if you think about it. Business. The, the less attention I focus on day-to-day -day sales, and the more I just focus on making every day be focusing on how can I create, increase my intrinsic value, the money will follow. Same thing for relationships. The more I focus on learning my frameworks, learning how to uh, uh, untether, get rid of the victim mindset and other internal shifts, growing my self-esteem, uh, learning my TTH and mastering my TTH, bettering my framework. So the higher this IV goes, sure, some days it's going to be better and worse, but eventually you'll see that eventually it's going to get better. Same thing for um, athletes, right? An athlete, they just practice every day, grow their intrinsic value of the, uh, their ability to perform their sport. Some days it's going to be good rounds, bad rounds, bad performance, good performance, bad performance. But at the end of the day, you're going to see that over the course of a long time, you're going to see improvement. You're going to see that this is higher highs and higher lows. Same thing for weather. You can try to um, improve the climate. But when you improve the climate, some days are going to be rainy, uh, 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 sunny, then rainy, hot, cold, right? But eventually, things, the whole weather is going to get better. Now, the thing about the farmer's mindset is that this is a very long-term process. This line right here for my business was probably a 15-year line before I saw a noticeable uptick. For my relationship, it was a five-year line. For most athletes, a 10-year line. To cultivate a farmer's mindset, there's a couple of things I do. So first of all, I look at life from a bigger time horizon. So I don't look at life in terms of a quarter. I don't look at life in terms of a month. I don't look at life in terms of a week. I look at life in terms of three, five, 10 years. And I teach my clients this too. So right now, a lot of clients who come into the program, for example, they think very short term. What do I need to say to make my life not so miserable in the next week, in the next day, in the next month? I'm trying to tell them, hey, Forget about the next week, the next month. If you keep thinking short term, you are operating by this. You're operating like a hunter. 
right? Where, oh my God, things are bad right now. Let me try to do something to fix it now. Once you fix it now, you get complacent, boom. But, 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 you're right. You just keep going up and down. I, I tell them, what do you need to focus on today? That will make your life three to five to 10 years later better. And I tell them this basically, hey, if you focus on these internal shifts, if you learn to grow yourself, if you learn the frameworks, for example, are you saying that if you master them, are you saying that you your life won't be better in three to five years? Sure, it won't be better in a month. It won't be better in six months, but will it be better in three to five years, in 10 years? Where, where, where will you be? And once you can see life in that big picture like that, it, it really allows you to get out of being so tethered to the up, up and downs of the day to day and, and to the steady growth of your intrinsic value. And that allows you to love the intrinsic, um, to love the process intrinsically every single day. And it just keeps you much more calm. The other thing that I do to give myself a farmer's mindset is that I tell myself the absurdity of being a hunter. So a lot of you guys who are new to saving your relationship, you ask me the question, what can I say or what can I do right now? So I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine, imagine you found the perfect set of words. You found the perfect set of things to do to convince your wife that you have changed. To come back, for example. Will your wife believe it? Think of the perfect set of words. Think of the perfect set of actions. Will your wife believe it? No. Those set of words do not exist. Because right now, she knows your intrinsic value. She knows your IV. So you can try to stretch a rubber band with tactics as high as you want. You can try to stretch this all you want, right? So basically, like a lot of what a lot of people try to do is they try to stretch this really high. How much can I go? But the more you stretch this, what happens if you stretch this is that it'll just snap back. Because again, it will mean revert to the IV. So yes, whatever tactics I can give you can really go high. You, you can go as high as you want, but the higher you go, the more it'll snap back. The worse it'll get. And a great example of this is with the client earlier, right? He was looking for tactics. Hey, let me just say this. Let me just say this. Guess what? When your their partner realizes that it's not real, boom, the amount of trust destroyed goes away. Because again, at the end of the day, you cannot go so far from this IV. It's like a rubber band, right? The more you stretch it, the more snap back. So looking for tactics, looking for short-term tactics, not only is a losing game because the answers don't exist, but again, nobody buys it. It doesn't work for the short term. It might feed you for a day, but nothing else. So learn to see your life in bigger time horizons, okay? And learn to love the process of increasing this green line while ignoring this orange line. Just ignore it. I see the orange line as more of a litmus test of how things are going than I do as a source for my, for my motivation. And the third thing is that I'm also very aware of everything that I do. So I account my day to the 15 minute increment and I account my day and I'm very discerning between what is that are the things that I do that are hunting based and what are the things that I do that are farming based. And I want to make sure that 80% of my day, 80% of my day is farming, is to build my farm. So 20%, I focus on this, right? Just as a way to, like a swimmer, when you swim, you look up to see where you are and you go back down, right? I just see this, look at this to see how things are going, whether I need to make any pivots in my work here. But 80% of the day, I focus on this. That's it. And once you can differentiate your time like that, be very disciplined. Farm, farm, farm. 80% of the day is spent in farming. Because I know that if I grow this, this, the orange line will follow. So my business, I focus on, 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 on activities that will build my intrinsic value. For my relationship, same thing. Everything in life, I focus mostly on here. As soon as, so as soon as I wake up, I remind myself of this visual right here. I want to work on the green line. How can I work on the green line? Not how can I work on the yellow line? Number three, celebrating process wins. So if you look at our community, you will see this is our, our typical engagement in a month, right? 
we have this many reactions, this many comments, this many posts. And I would say the majority of these posts are what we call process wins, process wins, process wins. So I've spent at this point in time, close to $500,000 in joining different masterminds, different coaching groups, et cetera. And I've noticed that the people who succeed the most in these groups, they're the people who don't really celebrate just outcome wins. They also celebrate process wins. In fact, for every outcome win they celebrate, they celebrate maybe 10, 15, 20 process wins. And what is the difference here? Process wins are when you celebrate doing the process. It doesn't necessarily lead to an outcome today, but you do the process. While outcome wins are wins where you need the outcome to happen, the good outcome to happen before you can celebrate it. But to be honest, you know, you know, if you look at a golfer, for example, or any athlete, for every single game they win, they have to maybe attend 100, 200, 300 sessions of practice. So if you only celebrate your outcome wins, is it no any any wonder why you hate the process of pra practicing? Because in your mind, the process of practicing doesn't really count because the only thing that counts is you winning. But what if you can change that? You can learn to love the process of practicing by celebrating each day you practice. And this is what process wins are. So if you look at the way people live their life, they never really celebrate the process. They see the process as a chore, as a grind, as a difficult thing, as something I have to do, a means to an end. But in our culture, we have a culture that makes the process win you doing the process into the end in itself, into something, a celebratory moment, into something like a fist pump moment where you can share it. The coaches can celebrate with you. Other members can celebrate with you. And it's an environment where we literally enjoy the process win with you. And one of the reasons why the community works so great is that, you know, celebrating process wins, it's not something you can do in just everyday life because it's not how people live their life. So if you go to your parents, if you go to your friends, for example, and you share your process win, they're going to go, mm, it's good, I guess. Yeah, because they don't get the value of process wins. But if you're in a community where people understand the value of process wins and they can pump up your process wins every single day, the 100, 200, 300 sessions of practice you have before one outcome you get. I mean, you can see how this can make you intrinsically love the process that much more, right? So this is important. You need to start sharing process wins. I share my process wins with my wife all the time, with my coaches all the time. That's a part of my lifestyle. Sure, I celebrate outcome wins, but I celebrate process wins even more by a factor of hundreds. Number four, cultivating an anti-outcome mind. So this is a big one. So remember in the previous uh, sessions, we talk about thriving, surviving, and crumbling. And thriving is how with more pressure, you m the more you rise. Surviving is the more pressure you hold it. You're not getting better, but you're holding it. Fragile or crumbling is when more pressure, you crumble. So in my life, if let's say, let's say my process is to conduct a conversation where I am there to listen, not to talk. So let's say <clears throat> I have a conversation here and my wife is really angry at me for something, for example. And I follow my process of staying thriving state, uh, listening, understanding, creating safety. And let's say, but in the conversation, she doesn't calm down. She's still angry. So outcome is bad, but I did the process. To me, that is a more of a reason for us to celebrate that process win even more is the anti-outcome mind. So the worse the outcome and the worse the outcome, the more I would do the process. And if I learn to do the process despite the outcome, I will celebrate that even more. Because eventually, if you keep focusing on that process, you will succeed. And the same thing with uh, investing, same thing with sports, right? When things are going badly, the more you need to double down on your process because that's how you can rescue yourself. If you go down and you abandon your process, they will actually need you to go down even more, okay? So make sure when things are bad, 
you follow the process even more. And when things are bad and you do the process, learn to celebrate that even more. Give it more dopamine hits. See how very differently this is than how people live their life. And this is the key to get into that thriving state where the more pressure because of a worse outcome, the more you rise. And you need to train your brain to do that by celebrating and the process of wins in an anti-outcome way. And the last thing that I do is just being very process obsessed. So if someone asks me how my day was, I don't tell them my day was good or bad because of certain outcomes. I tell them because I did a certain process uh, or this process is doing well. If someone asks me, how's your relationship going? I don't think about, hmm, what's been happening so far? How many times are we having sex today? How many arguments are we having? I'm thinking about, hmm, how comfortable do I feel with my process of leading conversations, of driving conversations? If I'm confident, I would say, I am, it's doing well. The process is doing well. So basically going back to this, when someone asks me about a question, I don't look at the, uh, the orange. I don't, I don't look at the orange line. I look at where is the green line, okay? Be very process obsessed. Now let's look at some misconceptions and pitfalls when it comes to untethering. There are six of them. Number one, never be naked. Remember that, never be naked. Jeff says never be naked, okay? Never accidentally get into hopeless indifference. When you take off the old, when you tell yourself that being so tethered to an outcome is so absurd, you need to replace it with something because you don't want to just say like, I don't want my partner anymore. I don't want this outcome anymore. No, let's not lie to yourself, right? You must always find and have the right process to shift to and focus on. Never fall accidentally into hopeless indifference. Number two, never put on wrong clothes. Sometimes. People, what they do is they try to shift away and shift into, but the thing they're shifting into is red pill ideologies, it, our toxic ideologies, are setting boundaries in the wrong way, and all these different tactics that don't actually work that actually create more damage. So the right processes, remember again, never appear like they're the right ones at first because of the rewards and punishment paradox. But the right processes always appear like they're the wrong ones initially. When you go naked, that's when you are very susceptible to new ideas. Understand what the new ideas are that are good and that are bad, which is why in a program and in my videos, I teach you principles, and, but I don't teach you tactics because I don't want you to just learn what are the right clothes to put on, but I want you to understand the thought process behind what makes the right clothes and the bad clothes. And I always tell this to my clients. If you want to go to therapy, go ahead, but take what you learn in this program, the principles you learn in this program to understand what are good ideas that you can adopt and what are bad ideas you should stay away from. Learn the principles. A lot of coaches, a lot of people just teach you the tactics because that's what you want, but very few people focus on the principles. Because of that, some people, they just put on whatever clothes they're given without asking and without the ability to ask, are these the right clothes or the wrong clothes? Right, But if I teach you principles, you can find your own clothes, but once you find your clothes, you know with confidence whether the clothes you pick are good clothes or bad clothes. It basically renders you bullshit proof. So again, never put on wrong clothes. Understand the principles. Do not misunderstand the principles. So a great example of this is once you understand untethering, for example, and you read a book like Think and Grow Rich that tells you to do a vision board you answer for yourself, is that right? Is that good or a bad thing to do? Okay. No monkeying around. Well, in our program, we call it chimpanzeeing. And the most common wrong close is either chimpanzeeing forward or chimpanzeeing back and forth. So if you look at a monkey, right? They go from one branch, they let go of this branch and they look, watch onto another branch and then another branch and another branch. So sometimes people, when they untether, they let go to their attachment to a certain outcome, but they pick another outcome in the future to latch onto. A common example of this is when people say, well, I'm doing this program for me not to save this relationship. It's for me to get another outcome. That is, you just chimpanzee it there. You just went, I'm letting go of this one outcome, but I'm latching onto another. So that's chimpanzeeing forward. Be careful of that. And you also want to be careful of chimpanzeeing back and forth. And this is something that I see, this really funny thing that I see 
uh, with people sometimes, right? So they are in a very tethered state where they say like, I need my outcome. And they say, I don't need it. Fuck, fuck her, right? Screw her. I don't need her. But of course, like deep down, they still want that relationship. So their indifference is fake. Their indifference is to just pretend like they're not bothered, but they're actually bothered. But it's just not bothered to appear like stoic, to appear alpha, to appear like, hmm, I'm cool. But when they realize that their indifference is not really fooling anyone, it's not making their partner come closer, they go like, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, let me go back to this again. And they just keep going back and forth, go back and forth, back and forth. That's chimpanzeeing back and forth. And it's almost impossible, guys, to do this alone. So think about how the right community and environment uh, is crucial for to make sure you're not chimpanzeeing, to make sure you're not putting on the wrong clothes, to never be naked, right? So in our program, we have this principle called never learn in a bubble. Always show your work. If you happen, let's say, to put on the wrong clothes, if you happen to fall into wrong, being wrongfully certain, you want to limit that to being wrongfully certain for like a day, two days tops, right? But if you show your work and you show where you are, you show your real progress, you allow the coaches to tell you, oh, are you on the right track or are you on the wrong track? So it's really hard to see through your blind spots because often we cannot even see the clothes that we're wearing or if we're latching onto the wrong process by ourselves. Uh, obviously, we follow the wrong process because we think the wrong process is the right process. There's not going to be a mechanism in our mind to question that. So a community that can tell you what's what, that can tell you straight, is very important. But it's also important to effectively uh, see through the disguises. Right, So often we have a disguise that we don't see. So a great example, this is my client up above again, who has been falling for a disguise, but he doesn't see how he's falling it because it falls within his blind spot until a coach or someone tells, tells him, dude, do you not see this right in front of you? This illusion is killing you right now. And it's also effectively uh, important to effectively put on the new. So if my clients, for example, post process of wins, they have hundreds of people celebrating making them feel good, making it easy for them to feel like, hmm, I can fall in love intrinsically with these processes. It's good. So again, remember, you need the right community. So if you can build this yourself, great. If you want to build it through the YouTube comments, if you haven't joined the program, great. But you need to have the right community and the right environment to really supercharge this thing. Remember that this is a paradoxical falling game. So again, you cannot use your willpower too much or try to untether by whipping yourself you will never untether. So again, you can never untether. Let me go back here. You can never untether with the surviving approach. You can never untether by telling yourself to untether. You can never untether by telling yourself or guilting yourself out of untethering. You have to have some very compelling stories, so com com compelling ammo, compelling reasons that are thriving behind your efforts here, behind the process. And this must be done with utmost creative, positive, and intentional energy. You can never just go through the motions here. You must feel the process. You must be intentional from the start of your day. So here, the mistake that I see some people making is that they just do whatever they want to do throughout the day. And at the end of the day, they find, hmm, did I do, did I make any process wins today? Right? That is not going to make you untether. You have to start from the beginning of the day and say, I'm going to do, make these process wins happen today. At the end of the day, you need to ask, did I or did I not make it happen today? Right? It shouldn't be like an accidental fluke thing that you either did or did not do a process win. And you can also need to uh, feel the process here. So there's some people in uh, who join the program even, right? A very few people join the program. They by the program, they do the work, yes, but they don't feel anything they say. They don't have any creative energy. They just do the motions. They just like take a box. Well, I did the auto suggestions, Jeff. It doesn't work. Well, that's like saying, I went to the gym, but I didn't do any workouts. I didn't do any workouts with passion. I showed up to practice, but I didn't practice with my brain or my heart. I just showed up to practice, but I'm not getting better. That sucks, right? Like, you have to actually show up to practice and show up to practice with your mind-muscle connection, right? 
with your heart in there. Because again, this is about shifting your emotions. You cannot just go through the motions here. So when you're making uh, all these stuff, when you're doing all these stuff, so when you're cultivating your fires from its mind, I want you to feel that, feel the value, feel the absurdity of the hunter's mindset, feel the value of the farmer's mind, feel your process of wins, feel the heebie-jeebies when you share it, feel it when you share this, feel four and five, right? Feel one, two, and three when you're taking off the old. You got to feel everything. But that's it on Untethering 101. Um, again, there are potentially many misconceptions people can have about untethering beyond these six. So again, if you want to make sure you don't fall for that trap of being wrongfully certain, leave a comment below. Okay, if you cannot, especially if you cannot join the program, leave a comment below, guys. Please leave a comment below. And if you want to go very deep into this community that teaches you how to untether in a deep way and more skills you need to raise the intrinsic value that you have, I have a masterclass that you can join. The masterclass is about an hour and a half long. I'll leave the link down below this video. At the end of the masterclass, if you want to apply for the program, you can do so. We'll give you instructions on that. A 20-minute instruction on how you can apply for the program. All right. With that said, guys, hope you enjoyed that. I'll see you in the next video.